It's 4 o'clock in Los Angeles. It's 6 o'clock in Chicago. And 7 p.m. in New York City. Hello, everybody. I'm Mad Bob DeCipio. Tonight, another episode of Wrestling with the Future. My special guest tonight is Mike, the movie maker Messier. Michael, how are you, friend? I'm doing great, Angelo. It's good to be here with you talking about pro wrestling again. And uh, this is going to be a fun show, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. You are quite welcome. Tonight, Mikey, some some subject matter that is near and dear to both of our hearts, the territory system, wrestling's golden age of territories. Yes. One of these... my favorite things to talk about. Yeah, Angela, I'm really looking forward to sinking our collective teeth into this one. I've got this photograph of uh, Nikita Koloff against Mike Rotundo going back to the Baltimore Arena. That's a venue that both of us went to as fans. Oh, that sure. would be a, Yeah, that would be a Jim Crockett Promotions uh, NWA show. But the AWA, World Class Championship Wrestling, so many, you know, the Fullers in the Continental Area, so many great promotions, Eddie Graham in Florida, so many. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I remember, oh, God, because I'm, I'm, I'm probably a little older than you, but I remember the territories, and just in the Northeast where I grew up, we had Philadelphia, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and Northern Virginia. We also had uh, parts of massachusetts and i believe that's where uh the wwwf capped off was that right at mass yes. um i think above massachusetts like vermont maine up that area uh the you know the, the east uh, northern east coast may have fallen underneath either Eddie Farhad, or it may have actually fallen under the Canadian Maritime and whoever the, the promoter is up there was. So I'm not sure. I know it, 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 it all, the, the territories were such, um, and they really were kind of like a smorgasbord for a while. You never knew <laughs> what yeah. was going to happen. Yeah. Um, what is your first memory, Mike, of the territory system? What do you remember? Well, uh, the youngest, uh, as a wrestling fan, like a lot of people, I grew up in Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C., WDCA, Channel 20, was uh, 11 o'clock on Saturday. So my first wrestling was Chief J and Brother Jules, Mr. Saido and Mr. Fuji. And believe it or not, Angelo, I attended my first pro wrestling match maybe a month before I got my first pro wrestling magazine and uh, wow. live event I'm talking about. And and for the live event, what I first noticed is picking up the program. You'd probably remember, you know, these three dollar or two. dollar. There was one that was three bucks, which was color and one that was black and white, which was two bucks that yep. the WWF sold. And the one with color. Uh, open it up, and there's a picture of Bob Backlund, and it says WWF Heavyweight Champion. Then there's a picture of this guy with long blonde hair and a blue sequin robe, and it says NWA World Heavyweight Champion Ric Flair. Yeah. So that was my first exposure to Ric Flair, was going to see Bob Backlund defend the title against Playboy Buddy Rose in the Landover, Maryland Capital Center, and discovering that although Bob is the champion, there's this other guy who's a champion. And Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I didn't even know about Bockwinkle or Ganya over in Minnesota. And then the next thing you know, Angelo, I'm I'm purchasing my first pro wrestling magazine, which I believe was a, uh, the wrestler with the Wild Samoans and Captain Lou Albano on the cover. And it said, what will happen when the Samoans get too smart for Lou Albano? And inside right. this inside this magazine, there's pictures of Carrie Von Eric fighting Harley Race for the Missouri title. Oh, God. There's, there's Cowboy Bob Orton versus Rick Martel. There's uh, AWA Battle Royal with uh, Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant in it. And within, you know, a couple of hours, Angelo, my scope of professional wrestling knowledge went from just what I saw on WWF with Backlund and Buddy Rose and Rocky Johnson. Suddenly yeah. there's a thousand new guys in my vocabulary in, in the scope oh, of sure. one hour. 
that that was the great thing about magazines like the wrestler pro wrestling illustrated inside wrestling um there was actually there was a boxing magazine that used to cut co- that used to cover wrestling also it was called ring magazine uh, if you were lucky enough to have ring magazine before it went exclusively boxing you have a real collector's item on your hand i remember so you're that's funny that, that to hear you say that that you, you your first recollection was jules and jay strongbow uh, my first recollection was killer kowalski and bruno san martino because yep. you know i saw my first match it was the wwwf at the philadelphia arena i was seven years old it was 1966 given my age away and uh my first the first time I ever remember seeing Lou Albano with his tag team partner, Tony Altamore. The Sicilians. They were called the, the Sicilians, yeah. yeah. And they wrestled Al Costello and the Kangaroos that night from Australia. Um, and they weren't a, a real WWF mainstay. They were brought, borrowed in. Because, you know, back in the day, Mikey, the way it used to work was the um, the territories would switch out talent. Not like today where they all have exclusive contracts. Everything was done on a handshake back in the day. So um, it is, you know, quite <laughs> quite the change over the years. Um, but my the first time I became aware of other people other than you know bulldog brower uh bruiser brody bruno san martino killer kowalski the valiant brothers um the wolfman listen to this one there was a guy called the wolfman okay pampero furpo eduardo carpentier i'm going back a little bit pat patterson you know yeah remarkable remarkable when you, um, yeah, go ahead, when, Mike. When you mentioned that they would have kind of like guest wrestlers come in, I think about even on the WWE Network or the Peacock, you know, if you find those Madison Square Garden shows and on YouTube, I find them all the time. Shows from uh, this is my buddy Carl here. Uh, I find hey, sh- Carl, Carl went to Carl went to WrestleMania 22, which I did a podcast with him about the Triple H Cena mm-hmm. one. Uh, but if you go back to those Madison Square Garden and Philadelphia Spectrum house shows, Angelo, yeah. you can see, like, you know, I think Kevin Von Erich wrestled in Madison Square Garden against Johnny Rods. Uh, yes, he did. Even, even up to 1984, J.J. Dillon came in and got an intercontinental title match against Tito Santana in Madison Square Garden. Yep. And J.J. still has the program. <laughs> <laughs> I know because I saw it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I saw that program. It's funny because everybody on the show, Mikey, signed it. Everybody uh, who worked the show that night signed it for him. That's you know, awesome. JJ was a, a, a you know a, a fairly unknown commodity here. Funny thing is, he's from Trenton, New Jersey, about forty-five minutes from here. You yeah. know, and he yeah. had to go to other territories to make his name. Which is, we're going to talk about that too tonight. Um, well, you know what? No time like the present. Let's talk about it now. How sure. about the idea, Mikey, of um, having to leave home to come back a hero? Let's well, talk back, about that. Well, I think it's a biblical passage, isn't it, Angelo? A, a hero is never well regarded in his hometown, or it's there something I believe. <laughs> so, you I go. mean, and, and, and the one of the stories that we've probably heard about is, is David Von Erich was being groomed to be NWA world champion, and they wanted to see if he could work heel. So Fritz and Eddie Graham sent David to Florida, yeah. where he, he – he, in a shoot and in a work, he's being mentored by Dory Funk as a heel. And uh, there's even footage, if you dig around YouTube, of very briefly Carrie and Kevin coming into Florida, and they're all heels – 
and they're all backing up Ric Flair against Butch Reed, who I think was known as Bruce Reed at the time. And he it's, was, it's, yeah, Bruce yeah. Reed. And it's it's just so amazing that you could have the Von Erichs are, are fighting, you know, tooth and nail with Ric Flair yeah. in Texas one week, and they're going to Florida the next week and, and backing him up because there was no internet and uh, there was not a million Dave Meltzer wannabes out there, you know, spoiling yeah. everything for everybody. So, um, but then you talk about guys like Dusty Rhodes and Andre the Giant. And to me, Angelo, those guys were like grand ambassadors, like Andre and Dusty. Uh, were guys that didn't really need a world championship belt. Everywhere yeah. they went, they were the people's champion. Oh, and sure. You could plug in Andre the Giant could come to Texas and team with Iceman Parsons against the Super Destroyers one week. And you could have Dusty Rhodes come into Mid South to team up with Junkyard Dog against, you know, some type of Russian team. And and these things would work because the fans even back then without the internet, just, just with the, the after magazines and just by word of mouth, they knew yeah. who Dusty was. They knew who Andre was. Oh, and sure. those those specific guys could come in for a tag team match, a battle royal, and, and it would work. It's funny, Mikey, because there were certain stars, and I use that word purposely. There were certain stars that transcended the territory system. Guys, you mentioned a couple of them. Guys like Dusty Rhodes, um, Iceman King, uh, uh, King Parsons, the Iceman from uh, World Class. You had uh, guys like Tiger Conway Jr. Um, who, who wrestled up here. I remember seeing him years ago. Um, the, uh, the, the idea of Ric Flair being a champion in any other place other than the Carolinas was foreign to me. You know, because I never saw Ric Flair outside the Carolinas until he became what was called the traveling champion. And then you had to go to St. Louis and pay homage to Mr. Mushnick. Then you had to go to Kansas City and pay homage to Mr. Race and Texas to Mr. Funk, et cetera, et cetera. The idea was you became a traveling champion you made your, so to speak, you made your bones. You paid your dues um, by paying homage to the guys who paved the way for you. Um, Ric Flair at the time needed that championship because he had not much else to go on, to be honest with you. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we, that's the truth. He has the same skill set, the same move set today that he did back then. But he managed to do something that was important. He had a personality. He developed a personality, the nature boy, which, by the way, he stole from Buddy Rogers right. with, with Buddy's blessing. But he said, the minute you F this up, kid, I'm taking it away from you. <laughs> so he did, he did the nature boy proud. Yes. I digress a little bit. of that That's my wrestling historian coming out. Um, let's tell everybody, Mikey, a little background here. Um, the original Alliance of Territories did have good intentions, and I believe that, Mikey. I think you would agree. But eventually, greed caused them to end up violating Sherman antitrust laws. Uh, which nearly broke up the NWA. Now, do you remember when that happened, Mike? Do you remember guess, what you're talking about? Because I, I do. I, my guess is that it would be the early, mid-60s, which led to the AWA being formed, but that's just my guess off the top of my head. That's exactly right. What happened was, and, and those of you that are that are paying attention, here's what happened. The National Wrestling Alliance in earnest, believed that they were the only wrestling organization of merit. And that was important, that word of merit. To the point where they thought they could get away with all kinds of shit, including taking payola and giving bribes to whomever it was necessary, you know, whose, whose ever's palms were necessary to Greece at the time. They got caught doing that in violation of the antitrust laws. And they were forced then to break up the NWA 
and the smaller groups. Most notably, the AWA and the AWF, the now defunct AWF. It was the American Wrestling Association and the American Wrestling Federation. At the time, this was 1967, but at the time in 1963, a group of misfits and malcontents, a guy named Vincent Kennedy, I'm sorry, Vincent James McMahon, and his partners, Joseph Tutsmont and Phil Zacco, decided, you know what? Um, we're not making the kind of money we think we can make here. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mushnick. But uh, we're going to be friendly with you. Or we're going to shake your hand, but we're going to leave. And we're going to form our own group. And Phil Mushnick, to his credit, gave Vince Sr., again, the handshake, good luck, you know, make a lot of money. Um, it actually was the best thing that ever happened to the NWA because for the first time, they had competition. Right. They had no real competition other than themselves. And we saw Vince McMahon Jr., Vincent Kennedy McMahon, we saw him do that to great failure, in fact. If you don't have healthy competition and, and all you have is your own competition to rely on, you're going to implode like a house of cards. And that's what happened. The, the Monday Night Wars is proof of that. WCW and WWE. That was competition in the, the truest, rawest form. Because they were head to head every week. Right. Would you not agree with that, Mikey? Oh, yeah, I totally agree with that. And, and when I hear you talk about the lull period, maybe, you know, 2001 when WCW died, and then you get into the PG era and you have Muppets guest hosting Monday Night Raw and the <laughs> Michael, you have, you have 200 wrestlers working for WWE. And you put Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler in the ring for 25 minutes at WrestleMania one year. So um, the lack of competition with, with all due respect to uh, total nonstop action wrestling that was, you know, on the, on there, but not quite competition, but yeah, you're right. Until AEW came along in 2019 and really lit a flame under WWE's uh, collective bottom, uh, things got stale there for a while. Yeah, they, they really did Mike. Um, one of the things that added to that lackluster era, and it really was, there was kind of like nothing really happening. Um, wrestling had to take a step back. Remembering where it came from, it came from the territories. And I think at some point, promoters and even wrestlers themselves interjected. I know Paul Levesque did for sure. Triple H, um, but he had a great platform. He was, you know, going out with the boss's daughter at the time, married her now. Um, but remembering that you have to take even that lackluster time and make use of it. And I think what they did to their credit was they took that time, Mike, to regroup. Okay. I think they took that time to regroup and say, okay, where have we come from and where do we want to go? And I think that's where you saw remnants of old school come back, remnants of the attitude era, remnants of wrestling, not sports entertainment, which I hate that term, by the way. I yeah, just, too. I abhor the term sports entertainment. And it bothers me to hear Paul Levesque defending that term because he's right. a fucking wrestler. He's not a sports entertainer. All his life, he said, I'm a wrestler. Now right. he's saying sports entertainment. We're all superstars. Well, and I'm sorry, Paul, but you're not all superstars. You know? Yeah. Here's well, what happened I was, back then. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry, Mikey. Go ahead. I was waiting for you to say three initials uh, NXT because I think while Vince was you know busy 
you know, having uh, UC Hot versus FTR on Monday Night Raw, Triple H and Associates were building up this NXT foundation right here in Florida. Yeah. And, and, and we can talk about this later in the show, Angelo, but these NXT wrestlers basically – uh, the the Florida circuit, which is they work pretty much the whole state at uh, these 400 seat venues. I went to one two weeks ago. I'm going to one in Gainesville uh, next weekend. And basically they have I'm sure they're losing money on these shows, Angelo. They charge 20 bucks for front row and 10 bucks for the rest of the place. There's only 400 seats. They're probably not making money or very little if they are. Yeah. But I think what what they've created for these NXT wrestlers, and this is not new. They've been doing this for 10 or 12 years. They're right. trying to give them a taste of what it was like to be a wrestler in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Sure. And, and it's an education for them. And for the fans, it's really good, Angelo, because I, I have all my issues with WWE. But when I go to these NXT shows and it's a family of four and they can get in the door for 40 bucks instead of 2000 if they yeah, went to exactly. WrestleMania <laughs> – you know what I mean? It's yeah, nice. Sure. The shows are tight. The, the, the two and a half hour shows instead of four hour. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a small venue. You can see everything. So anyway, uh, I just want to throw that in there. Mikey, it, it, no, I'm glad you did because it's reminiscent to me of the studio days, which was also a, an integral part of the territory system. Every, do you know, I'm going to show you a clip here in a moment. Do you know, Mike, that at one time in this country, from 1948 to 1982, and you and you you know what happened in 1982, but from 1948 to 1982, there were no less than 325 full-time independent wrestling promotions. 90% of them under the banner of the National Wrestling Alliance. What happened in 1982, Mike Messier? Vince Jr. bought the $7, seven million valued WWF from his father. He paid $1 million for a $7 million company because his father was on his deathbed. And yeah. uh, Vince Jr. bought his dying father out. And, and hey, look. You know, if, if I had a, a major company, if I had a son, I'd probably do the same thing. But that's what happened. That's exactly what happened. Let me tell everybody what happened here. Um, okay. The real decline of the NWA territory system began to occur in the early 1980s. As cable television became more and more popular, the WWF, formerly known as the WWWF, and today known as WWE, operated by Vincent K. McMahon, recognized this and were able to gain a national prime time foothold on the other three initials, Mikey, USA Network. Yeah. Important. This complete, this move alone completely changed the landscape uh, as uh, professional wrestling was now no longer a regional occupation but a national phenomenon and wrestling came into its own in large part thanks to vince mcmahon and uh and i guess by proxy in large part to vincent james mcmahon um for giving his son you know a little bit of money to play with um i believe what vince said if his father knew what he had intended for that money, I don't think he'd ever give it to him. That's better not. Yeah, and because here's why I say that. If you look back, you remember, Mikey, do you remember the day, that infamous day in wrestling history they called Black Saturday? Yeah, 1984. Was it July 4th, 84, or July 5th, something like that? July 4th, 1984. Sure was. It was a hell of a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the fans the fans across the country in the United States who tune in every week to see the wrestlers from Georgia Championship Wrestling, the Ronnie Garvins, Brad Armstrongs, uh, they tuned in 
and to their hosted by Gordon Soley, who was the Walter Cronkite of professional wrestling. So Absolutely. they tune in expecting to see their Georgia championship wrestlers. And instead they see Freddie Miller, who was always one of these promo guys for Georgia championship wrestling. And suddenly Freddie has a totally different facial expression and he's introducing us to Vincent Kennedy McMahon. <laughs> he's introducing yeah. us to Vince jr. And Vince Jr. is telling us whatever he's – he introduces the show, but basically instead of having it all in the studio, he's got a hodgepodge. There's some matches in the studio. There's some matches taped from arena shows. Mm -hmm. um, believe it or not, I've, I've found some of those original broadcasts of Black Saturday. And the show, if it was just the show in a vacuum, would be great. But the fact that they replaced by force – Georgia championship wrestling that for, I don't know, 20 years, yeah. or 15 years at least was such a mainstay for people. I mean, uh, Angelo, people set their weekends by this thing. Hey, we're going to yeah. stay home and watch. It was too much. I think Mike, you're right on it. You're right on it. People were regimented by it. They were regimented. They set their clocks by it. They, they, they set their daily routine by it. Six Oh five every Saturday. Right. That was the time. That was the, the 605 on TBS. That was every week. You you didn't miss it. You know? And yeah, it was and a very specific time, 605, not six o'clock. Yeah, because here's Ted the other thing about that. <laughs> sure. And, and I, I'm I, I I digress, but the one thing about that that the takeaway is critical is that was the one thing that Vince McMahon did. That failed almost immediately. And he was forced to sell. But in so doing, Mike Messier, something happened that, again, changed the entire world of pro wrestling. He sold his interest to Jim Crockett for $3.1 million. That $3.1 million that Mr. Crockett gave to Mr. McMahon was Jim Crockett's death knell because Vince McMahon took that $3 million and created this thing we call WrestleMania. And the world of wrestling has never been the same since. He took a crap shoot on it. He rolled the dice and it paid off in a very, very big way. Mike, you take over from here. Well, the 605 thing, what was interesting about that time is, you know, Ted Turner, um, I believe he suffered from bipolar illness, which, you know, he saw things in a different way. Yeah. And the, his his thinking, and I think this was a Ted Turner initiative, is if I start my programs five minutes after, then people are going to be on my five minute, you know, time clock. And if they see Andy Griffith is leading into the next show at 605 or the 605 show goes to 805 and then they're trying to switch to the movie on another channel they're going to switch right back to TBS because I've hooked them and that it's kind of a cool thing and and Angela we see this to the day with Billy Corgan now owns what is the National Wrestling Alliance they what's still do this gimmick. It, yeah really what's yeah, left of it what's left of it but they're doing some things and they have a TV title now that has a six minute and five second time limit for the TV title matches. So, like you said, people still remember this 605 thing. It was a great marketing ploy. I'll give them that. It really is. I mean, you know, there are, <laughs> there are actually podcasts out there called, I can't make this, it's called the 605 podcast. There's actually yeah. a wrestling podcast called the 605 podcast. Um, I, I, I did want to listen to it. Yeah, I, um, I just want to jump in one one quick thing, Angelo. Oh, please, uh, Any, anything you want, anything you want. Well, we talked about Vince on the USA Network, which he did quite well with, but there was actually a wrestling program on USA Network before Vince McMahon. Did you know that? Yeah, I did. It was, yeah, it was Joe Blanchard and Southwest Championship Wrestling. Southwest Championship Wrestling and my friend Andy Mansfield. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. The Continental Lover. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So That's the, 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 I, I, I get upset sometimes, Angelo, when when today's modern day fan, they seem their only historical references to wrestling are when they watch the WWE A&E biographies or they've gotten 
you know, the a, uh, the WWE home videos and those documentaries are, are all well and good. They're very slickly produced. They have yeah. great montages and they do do a nice job. However, it's through the goggles of the WWE. So yeah. every, I mean, they did a whole documentary about the missing Bret Hart, Tom McGee match, which didn't mention Colt Cabana or Dave Meltzer, who were basically yeah. the guys that made that thing a thing. So I just say that to say that for the wrestling, the young wrestling fans out there who might want to really consume this stuff like we do, don't just believe what the WWE spoon feeds you. You have to find yeah. other sources of material like, like Angelo's shows, uh, like the stuff that I do on my YouTube channel, One Pro Wrestling and Sports Fan. You've got to find information out there that's counter culture, that's counter corporate, because the WWE is not going to tell you the whole story. They're going to tell you their version of events. Absolutely. And they have been doing that since day one. It's almost, Mikey, like they live in this bubble and nothing exists beyond it. And that's caused real, real life issues for WWE. It's caused real life problems for not only wwe as a corporate entity but its employees as individuals because they can't relate to what's happening beyond the walls of titan tower they just can't yeah much like and fairness i look there's plenty of blame to go around in fairness like Eric Bischoff, that's Eric Bischoff. I almost, I almost called him a bad name, by the way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like Eric Bischoff did at CNN Center, but he didn't know what was going on outside of CNN Center, and his view of wrestling was so skewed, so abysmal in in its vision that they they I think as a fluke. I don't know how, even still today, I don't know how they managed to beat WWE for like, you know, a year and a half almost, you know, 83 weeks or whatever it was. 83 weeks, yeah. Yeah, 83 weeks they beat them in the ratings. But as, as it would happen, you know, WCW told everybody, go watch WWE, Nick Foley's going to win the title tonight. That's either the most brilliant marketing or the dumbest fucking thing I ever heard in my life. Why would you tell the, them you don't want them to go to your competition? You right. want them to stay there. Yeah, the, what Crazy. what they were what they were what Bischoff was thinking and he ordered Tony Giovanni to do that was if I spoil the match results then people won't want to see it and they'll stick with what we're doing over here on nitro. And the exact opposite happened. People were getting kind of bored with what was going on in nitro. Say, so, Oh yeah. Mick Foley's winning the title. Let me, let me see that. So, Oh, wait um, a minute, Mikey, Mick Foley, one of the most beloved people in wrestling. And yes. on top of that, a very dear friend of Tony Schiavone. Yeah. How yeah, did and, you like and, to bring that guy? Well, well, Tony Schiavone has has he and Mick eventually kissed and made up. I think Mick actually reached out to Tony and called him and uh, told him that you hurt my feelings. And Tony apologized and said I did what I was told to do and blah blah blah. And uh, Schiavone, to his credit, uh, I think he had a comic book come out a few years ago that was called Butts and Seats: The Tony Schiavone Story. Yes. Um, the, <laughs> yes. the thing that um, I wanted to mention, uh, Angelo, is that I had a graphic novel that was called like the professional wrestling historical S story. And Jim Cornette was kind of in it. And it was a graphic novel about the history of pro wrestling. And there was a group you mentioned one of them, Toots Mont. Um, yeah. Wasn't there something? Uh, see, I'm, I'm asking you because my memory fades on this one, but there was something mm -hmm. around the 1940s called like the golden triangle. There was like three, I think Toots was one of them. And there was two other, maybe Strangler Lewis or, Something mm -hmm. like that. There was three three key guys. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do. It was Strangler, Ed Lewis, Phil Mushnick, and um, to Joseph Tutsmont. Vince McMahon became the third member of that triangle when Ed Strangler Lewis had to bow out for health reasons because he was still an active wrestler at the time. So he had to quit wrestling and became a referee, 
uh, and he and he's seen in a lot of old forties and fifties film clips or kinescopes even. That's that's how old that was. Uh, of refereeing various matches. Uh, that's how Vince McMahon became a part of you know the inner circle, and then he brought in Phil Zacco and. Mushnick brought in Luthez, and um, later on in the middle to late 50s, early 60s, Bruno became a member of that, uh, as did, um, um, oh, God, um, give me a second. I'll tell you in a minute. The guy from Canada, um, Gene Kaniski. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Gene Kaniski, yep. Uh, and they became like the power brokers of wrestling for a long time. But I want to show you something, Mike. I compiled a list here that might surprise you. Okay. This is a list of National Wrestling Alliance, that only, only National Wrestling Alliance promotions from 1948 to 1982. Watch this. NWA Mid America, Maple Leaf Wrestling. Oh, yeah, I could stop this anywhere you want, brother. Oh, I'm just reading them. Yeah, NWA oh, Indianapolis, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Salt, Salt Lake Wrestling Club, Championship Wrestling from Florida, Western State Sports, Foothills Athletic Club, Jim Crockett Promotions, Japan Pro Wrestling Alliance, NWA Big Time Wrestling, World Class Championship Wrestling, All Japan Pro Wrestling, Korean Wrestling Association. Uh, Capital Sports Promotions, World Wrestling Council, that was huge. Yeah. Uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling in the 90s, NWA Florida in the 90s and 2000s, Ohio Valley, I think they're still around in some they regard. Are. They yeah. sure are. NWA Georgia, uh, NWA West Virginia, NWA Southwest, NWA Fusion in the state of Virginia, NWA Absolute Entertainment. Wow, just so many. Central this, States this is, Wrestling. Yeah, Mikey, this is all under the NWA banner. This is just the NWA banner. This yeah. is how big this company was. And where's more? Here's one. NWA Cold Front in New England. That's interesting to me. NWA Empire in New York. Uh, Fusion Pro Wrestling, NWA Great Championship Wrestling, NWA Indiana, NWA Liberty States, New Jersey, NWA Mexico, uh, Mr. Chainsaw Pro Wrestling, <laughs> NWA On Fire, NWA Pro Wrestling, David Marquez. I've seen them live, actually. Uh, NW Hollywood NWA Wrestling, I've seen them live a few times. NWA Wrestle Birmingham, NWA Wales. NWA Bayou Independent Wrestling from Louisiana. NWA Wildcat, I've definitely heard of them. Uh, NWA Branded Outlaw Wrestling from San Antonio. NWA Big Apple from New York and New Jersey and Connecticut. Right. That's ex that's that's amazing. And uh, I'll give you credit that for that. Crazy? Right. Well, now here's check this out, brother. Sure. Go ahead. Watch this. It gets better. Wow. I love this map because it has the, the individual characters who right. represent the, the, the main stars who represented the areas. You look over there's Bruno, there's Kaniski, there's Stu Hart, um, um, uh, oh, uh, um, Maya Nick Via, Hockwinkle, yeah, Carlos um, Colon, Edward Carpentier. Uh, Rick Flair in the Carolinas, the Briscoes in Atlanta, Dusty in Florida, mm -hmm. uh, Baba and Inoki that were kind of competitors in Japan. Chief uh, Maivia. Yeah, the Sheik. This is a guy I'm not too aware of. Larry Casabasco, Northland Wrestling Enterprise. Uh, that's new to me. That guy's new to me. Um, Playboy Buddy Rose from the mm -hmm. Pacific Northwest. Pepper Gomez. Uh, yeah, Gene Kadiski from yeah, that's that's a nice graphic. Yeah, check this out. Then you have Mexico with CMML, mm -hmm. 
Essential States with Bob Geigel. New Japan, of course, is, is a member of the NWA, or was anyway. Yeah. I've got that DVD. Yep. Houston Wrestling. That's Detroit. I like the Hurt People, the film. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. In Atlantic, Blackjack Mulligan, Central States. That's Harley Race and uh, Larry Henning, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, here's Championship Wrestling from Florida. There you go, Florida. yeah, Championship Wrestling from Florida. That was the first NWA I ever was exposed to, was Championship well, that's a good Wrestling one. from And, and I, I it, as a side note, you said with your host, Gordon Soley, yes. as a side note, I'm, I'm very dear friends with Gordon's daughter, Pam. And I am the very last person that ever had his photo taken with Gordon Soley. Wow. I'm the, I'm the last person he ever took a picture with. That's awesome. And I, and I still have that picture. That's great. I had a book of, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Mikey. Yeah. Go ahead. I, ha I had a book that Gordon Soley wrote and it was not even really about wrestling. It was like poetry and all types oh, of stuff. Yes. Yes. Yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, he was a hell of a writer. Yeah. People yeah. don't know that. He he actually wrote three non-wrestling, uh, two non-wrestling books and one wrestling book. I think I had one of the non-wrestling ones then. So Daryl is here. Daryl says, I really enjoyed the AWA as well as the NWA and WWF. And a lot of people, we're going to talk a little bit. I'm Daryl, thank you for bringing that up. One of the things after we, uh, we, we see this graphic, Mikey, um, we're going to come back. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the lesser known uh, territories that people may, you know, have blinked and, you know, and gone away. Um, we'll talk about that after this. Mid South. Bachwinkle, Ray Stevens. Yeah. Southeastern, the Fullers and Bob Roop. Texas All Star. Oh, yeah. And I'll tell you what, that when you look at that map, Mikey, and yeah. you look at the graphics that preceded that, all of the NWA territories. And, and I'm glad you were reading them off because they were all NWA. Right. And people don't understand the scope of that organization, just how big it was. Yeah. It was, it, it truly was the first global promotion for all intents and purposes, long before, you know, the WWE, you know, universe or whatever they want to call it now, whatever it is. Right. But long before that, the NWA, where everything went wrong is that one fateful moment, that one financial transaction between Jim Crockett, who ordinarily is a smart businessman. Right. He underestimated Vinnie Mac big time because he took Vinnie, <laughs> God bless him that piece of shit but right. then he took it, crockett's money and turned around and buried crockett with it well let me and everybody let me, else really think about it mike I, I i i am thinking about it but i would i would kind of counter that angelo by saying you know it's funny because if people think about 605 wrestling a lot of times they merge their memories into the pre-1984 Georgia Championship Wrestling with you know Tommy Rich and Buzz Sawyer and the yeah. very young Road Warriors and Ted DiBiase and the Mass Superstar. They kind of memory merged that with the Mid Atlantic takeover, which was more like Magnum TA and Dusty Rhodes yeah. and the Four Horsemen. But the reality is they're two different groups. There's the Georgia group with like Ole Anderson and then Jack and Jerry Briscoe. And then there's the Jim Crockett Jr. Promotions Group, mm -hmm. and there was some overlap, but they're two distinct yeah. things. My my challenge to what you're saying, though, Angelo, is 
things that a lot of us hold dear to us, uh, 605 in the mid 80s and after when you, right. you know, you had Ronnie Garvin versus Ric Flair on, on a Saturday night for free on TBS if you had basic cable and all that great stuff, the four horsemen and the promos and the Space mm -hmm. Mountain, all that stuff came with Jim Crockett promotions getting that 605 time block. So oh, if no, they, no doubt about it. Absolutely. I, I, I agree a thousand percent. Yeah. So if, the if, best wrestling, too, quite frankly. Right. And so if he didn't make that purchase and from Vince and yes, Vince took that money and ran with it and did WrestleMania. But if Jim Crockett Jr. didn't raise the game of Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling as under the NWA umbrella, what would we have for that, you know, second half of the 80s into the 90s? Yeah. We and, and eventually, as we know, uh, Jim Crockett did make that purchase. And within six or seven years, he's selling his company, actually less than that. He's selling his company to Ted Turner. And yeah. then WCW comes in and they had three or four years of just losing money. And you yeah. went through the Ole Andersons and the Kip Fries and the Bill Watts until Bischoff comes in and does all the things that he did. But and you're uh, right. You're right there. You're right there and where we are, um, because that's important. That's critical, in fact, to the to what happens in the next few years in the territory system between buying up other NWA promotions. Um, the deal with Vince and the general and general TV production cost Jim Crockett promotions was facing bankruptcy in 1988 it was at that moment that ted turner would swoop in and buy jim crockett promote promotions renaming it world championship wrestling which would go on to see some of the greatest competition that wwf ever faced and that would later be known as the monday night wars and that's kind of where we are right now uh, in in the scheme of things the promotions are now head to head. The NWA essentially is disbanding by the minute right. because they just can't, they're financially insolvent at this point. There's literally no money in the coffers. You had a few, and God bless them, but you had a few, Mikey, the holdouts of yeah. the old NWA days. Dennis Carluzzo uh, in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Den Dennis Carluzzo in New Jersey was one. Yep. The late Gino Moore was yep. another. Um, and they hated each other because they were. <laughs> and I knew them both. And yeah. they were both friends of mine. But they, I was maybe the only bridge between the two guys because they couldn't stand each other. Wasn't there a, a balder guy named like Harold Brody? Was that a guy? Like Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's 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 complicated. And, and bad memories. <laughs> sorry, man. I just I, these these memories are just popping into my mind because now I, I don't want to uh, just derail us, but I think of stuff like I did. I think the NWA begot something called Tri-State Wrestling that was probably up your street. You know, probably right Tri where you live. Yeah, Tri-State Wrestling was Joel Goodhart. Right. And Joel Goodhart actually sold that company to a guy named Todd Gordon, who bought it and be, and it became Eastern Championship Wrestling. Right. Which Todd brought in Paul Heyman and Eddie Gilbert. Well, and I'm sorry, Eddie Gilbert first. Yes. And then Eddie Gilbert brought Paul Heyman in. And that became, that was the birth of Extreme Championship Wrestling. Actually, to be honest, to be very candid about it, we have to thank Shane Douglas for ushering in Extreme Championship Wrestling because he took the NWA, the prestigious belt, and threw it down and stomped on it and, yeah. and said that it meant nothing. In fact, at this point, the NWA territory system was on life support. Yes. And even though WCW initially promoted NWA championships, they soon realized that the NWA needed WCW more than WCW needed the NWA. Because of this, WCW officially withdrew 
from the NWA in September 1993. After this Eastern Championship Wrestling, Mikey, we're right on the same page, literally yeah. on the same page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eastern Championship Wrestling, one of the last true promotions, held a tournament to crown the NWA champion. Wrestler Shane Douglas would go on, uh, not want to be a champion of the uh, promotion that died seven months earlier. Yada, yada. So we know the story there. But right. that essentially what you and I were talking about was right the, the next thing under it. Well, I, I got to say, Angelo, and, and I never realized this before, but if we say that the NWA Tri-State Wrestling, NWA Eastern Championship Wrestling becomes Extreme Championship Wrestling, then that runs its life cycle, but then the WWE reincarnates it in 2006 for two or three or four years, right? And they have We're horrible. The, the, yes, but they had the WWE polished version of ECW, which didn't go over very well. But that you know why, that, Mikey? You know yeah, why? Because, because it wasn't the real ECW thing. wasn't polished. Right. Right. That was that was its that, that was the draw. Yeah, there were a but, bunch of roughnecks. That was the whole draw. I, I Right. But what I'm saying is because the WWE had a third promotion, Raw, SmackDown, and they have this third show, which is younger guys, different guys, untested guys, a lot of pretty women in the WWE, ECW. Kelly Kelly's 19 years old and stripping and stuff. But basically that created a third option, so to speak. Sure. And that, that third option eventually got filled by NXT, like the game show, the reality show of, of wrestlers competing to be wrestlers. And then eventually that NXT got tweaked into the modern NXT, which is the training camp. And what I'm seeing here in Florida. So my whole point is, if you take the lineage of the current NXT of what I'm seeing down the road, you know, for 10 bucks a show, and, and, and the Joe Gacy's and, and all these people that come up from NXT in 2024, the lineage yeah. goes to the WWE ECW, which goes back five years early to the real ECW, which goes back to Eastern Championship Wrestling under NWA, which goes back to Tri-State Wrestling, which goes back to all these other things. So as as much as you know, Vince McMahon Jr. would have liked to have said, I'm an island of ton myself, he can never fully do that because the branches of the wrestling family tree are too deep for even Vince yeah. to stop. Um, Daryl Willie is in our chat. He says, I think after Magnum TA accident, it hurt NWA. Let's talk about this real quick, Mikey. Sure. It, did it really matter? I mean, you know, and I, you know, we had Magnum on our show. Yeah. Uh, so we know, you know, we love Magnum anyway. But did Magnum's accident really have anything to do with the downfall of NWA? Or by that point, Mikey, was it all just kind of like on life support anyway? Well, it's, an, it's another one of those things, Daryl. And I think, look, as NWA fans and wrestling fans, we would have loved to have seen Magnum go deep into the 90s. And but th here's the way I see it, Daryl. I, I believe that. Uh, Magnum TA's absence as a wrestler, and he did do commentary. I thought I thought Magnum was good as a commentator, but yeah, he really was. Yeah, Magnum's Magnum's absence, I believe, was filled by Sting. I think Sting came along a year and a half later, and that same spot that Magnum would have had in the '90s is is more or less the Sting spot. And Sting was probably ten years younger than Magnum TA, so yeah. maybe Sting went longer with it anyway. And, and I'm not trying to diminish Magnum TA at all because he was awesome. But yeah. the reality is uh, he was popular. He was a little bit smaller than we might remember. He was about 235. Right. So would he have really been the bigger than life superstar of a Hulk Hogan or, or ultimate warrior as far as the NWA goes? I don't really know. I mean, I, like I said, I think his absence left a hole that sting filled eventually. I think you're absolutely right about that. I really do. I mean, um, it, and and it, I think really, if you think about it, it had to happen that way, just as a natural progression. You know, what, they couldn't really do anything with Magnum. First of all, thank God he lived, but he almost didn't. Yeah. You know, but and I don't think it would have really made in the long in the long run, and you know, as they say in the grand scheme of things. I think it would have played out the same way 
Um, NWA would have just died a slow, gruesome death anyway. At least Magnum didn't die a slow, gruesome death. You know, he's still, thank God he's still around. And, and, um, and uh, Magnum has been essential, and I believe it's his stepdaughter is Tessa Blanchard, and, and hopefully yeah. she'll she'll get back into the fold. But I wanted to, going back about 10 minutes in the conversation, Angelo, you pointed out that it was probably a mistake for Jim Crockett to pay this money to Vince McMahon for the 605. Mm-hmm. I kind of debated that, but where I would put that, assertion of money poorly spent and you did mention it jim crockett spending i believe a million dollars on the skeletons of florida championship wrestling and a million dollars on the skeletons and the tv rights of of uwf universal wrestling federation yeah i think the bigger mistake especially with the florida because florida unfortunately was dead by then for for it's almost like he was too nice of a guy it's like he was Jim Crockett Jr. was too nice of a guy because he's trying to give, you know, probably at that time it's Mike Graham, not even Eddie Graham, because Eddie had passed yeah. away. And yeah. he's, he's trying Ooh. to be a nice guy and give a million bucks here and a million bucks there. But the reality is that's $2 million. And in 1987, wrestling money, that's like she would be, it would be $200 million today. Well, let's talk about that. Jim Crockett Jr. Again, we're dealing with two sets of family with a senior and a junior okay you had you know vince senior we call him vince senior and vince junior and you had jim crockett senior and jim crockett junior i think of the two sets here i think that jim crockett junior um was by far the most haphazard financially i don't think he saw the big picture I don't think he saw the long picture. Um, he took, now keep in mind, that Mikey, he took his father's money upon his father's passing, and Jim Crockett Sr. left substantial millions, not, you know, six or seven. I'm talking about 30 or 40 million. He was a very, very wealthy man. He owned a baseball team, a baseball stadium, a chain of car lots. He owned a corporate office building. He was a very shrewd. Oh, and on top of that, he owned a concert venue to to top it all off. Okay. But in so doing, he amassed an incredible amount of wealth, wealth that his son went nuts with. Again, another junior going crazy with the money. Right? Yeah. All of that money went to buying airplanes and paying this guy a million and giving that guy a million. Oh, and they bought buses for their wrestlers and they bought another airplane and called it the Stardust. You know, that's by the way, the you know, a, a side note, folks, that's where Dusty Rhodes got the name to tell his kid Cody, call yourself Stardust because your brother's the gold dust, <laughs> baby, right. if you will. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, anyway, but this is what we're yeah. talking about. We're talking yeah. about a guy who just thought he had endless pockets of money here. Well, before he knew it, the the endless pile of money ended. Yeah, and he had nothing but bagats in his hand, as we say yeah. in Italian, which means nothing. <laughs> you know. I, I, it makes me think, Angelo, and and probably I know that Dusty did some shoot interviews before he passed away and stuff, and I think mm-hmm. they brought this type of thing. What exactly what you're talking about? You know, when they bought the UWF from Bill Watts, I guess Bill Watts had an office building in Dallas, Texas, and Jim Crockett Jr., despite his siblings telling him not to do it, he basically took all their stuff that was in Charlotte, the office and the paperwork and everything. And moved he moved it, it all. He moved it to Texas. He moved it to Texas, and it's it's like, wait a minute! All the wrestlers are in Charlotte. Was it Briarwood Drive? Was that the address of their uh, their Six office? Twelve Briarwood Drive. Right, and it's yep. like he's he's relocating everything. And and to me, what it was is Jim Crockett Jr. In his mind, was competing head to head with Vince McMahon Jr. And that's a that's a game you can't win. So um, it's like he he just kind of bought into that competition thing. And instead of 
concentrating on what made their company different, which was the better wrestling, the more violent wrestling, the war games, the road warriors, the four yeah. horsemen, Dusty. Instead of just concentrating on his positives, he got too much like, I want to be like Vince Jr. to, to do him any good. Well, that, that was never going to happen, Mike. I mean, the one thing that he did that Vince jumped on right away, as soon as he got that cash in his hand, as soon as he got that money from Crockett, he took Jim Crockett's idea of this new thing called Starcade, the big stadium show. Now, wrestling had, you know, it, wrestling was no stranger to stadiums. Of course, we know that in Texas, Kerry Von Erich, Ric Flair, Texas Stadium, Bruno, um, Larry Zabisco, Shea Stadium, New York. We know that. And we're talking in the 70s and stuff, right? Okay. So we get that. But then there's this whole idea, this concept idea of the wrestling super show calling it Starcade. Well, Vince sees this. He knows this. Now he's got Crockett's money in his hand because the check cleared, right? Yeah. Now he's going to say, okay, Pat, okay, uh, Tony Garia, okay, my, my circle over here. I got some money. Let, what do we want to do with this? You know? Let's put on a wrestling super show like that, that guy in... in you know, North Carolina did or whatever the fuck it's from, you right. know, and um, let's do what he did. Only let's do it better. Right. So, he yeah, rolled the dice and and there you go. The birth of WrestleMania. Yeah. And, and, and for like once again, Angelo, for the younger fans out there who who you want to hear the perspective. Did you know that there was two Starcade shows before there was ever any WrestleMania shows? There was a Starcade 83 and a Starcade 84. And yep. if you want to talk about, you know, Mr. T at WrestleMania 1 and Muhammad Ali at WrestleMania 1 and Mike Tyson at WrestleMania 14, well, there was uh, Smoking Joe Frazier was the guest mm -hmm. referee for Starcade 84, uh, Dusty versus Flair. And I believe that Dusty, who I believe coined the term Starcade. He uh, did. Yep. Dusty was trying to get himself a match with Joe Frazier, believe it or not. So that's why they oh, yes. did that. But um, my because thing with that. At the, because you know why? Mike? Because Muhammad Ali had already done it in WWE. Right. Well, I mean, WWF. Yeah. When Gorilla Monsoon tossed him around a little bit. Yeah. And he had the fight with Anoki, which was uh, horrible. But, that you know, the. <laughs> yeah. The. But I'll say this, Angelo, even with it's funny because you can always say something was the first. But if you really dig beneath it, you know, George Washington wasn't really the first president of the United States. He nope. was the first president once we were fully independent. But there was other people running the show before that. And similarly, we say that Starcade was like the first super show. But the reality right. is. They'd been doing Thanksgiving night wrestling shows in the Greensboro Coliseum and other major venues throughout the country oh, for yeah. 10, 20 years before there was a Starcade. You can go oh, and, yeah. and you can find, and I think they just called it the Thanksgiving night spectacular at the they Greensboro did. Coliseum. Yeah. And it's, and it's it stuff was like every, think about this, what Mike is saying. Think about what Mike Messier is saying. By the way, you can find him on MikeMessier.com. And what's your YouTube, Mikey? Uh, it's one, since the last one. Yeah, it's it's uh thank you. One pro wrestling and sports fan. That's the number one pro wrestling and sports fan. And then one man and a camera films. And for my film reviews, it's one Mike Messier. And if you go to MikeMessier.com, all my links are right from there. There you go. So, Mikey, I'm gonna we have a few minutes left. I want to let you take this from the I'm gonna see if we got another question in here. Um Sting ended up, yeah. Well, well yeah, Daryl and Mikey already said that, but thank you for echoing his thoughts. Um, let's talk about this a little bit. We got a, a few minutes left before we go out. Um, and take as much time as you want, Mikey. How, in your opinion, in your estimation, will the wrestling territories be remembered? And is there ever a chance? They say never say in wrestling. They say never say never. 
But is there a chance that we could see a return to some sort of resemblance of the territories? I'm, I'm going to say something that might be a little counterintuitive. I don't think the territories ever fully died, and I don't think they ever fully will, because I think we talked about ECW. In my opinion, ECW was simultaneously the last of the old school territories and like a bridge territory to modern yeah. day. I yeah. think NXT, what you see on television at the at the Full Sail University soundstage, that is a very slick production. Well, what mm -hmm. I see at the Armory in Jacksonville, you know, in front of 400 fans, and, yeah. you know, in, in September I went to Orlando and they had no air conditioning and this place was stinking hot and the fans yeah. didn't I, – I was the first one to leave, but the other fans are sticking around in 90 degrees, uh, unair conditioned venue watching these wrestlers. Oh, I'm telling you. It, it might be a facsimile, uh, but it's pretty close to the real thing of, of an old school territory. And even this, yeah. uh, Angelo, right here in Jacksonville at Daly's Place during the pandemic era, basically two, two and a half years of Jacksonville, Florida, having weekly wrestling on Wednesday nights. They had a lot of bonus shows uh, on Fridays and Saturdays. They yeah. had a house, a house show that I put on my YouTube channel because I taped it with my phone. They had pay-per-views all out of the same venue, week in and week out. And and I'll say this, I wish I worked for AEW because I would have gotten them some more fans in there. They did a terrible job with word-of-mouth advertising. Not enough people knew about it. But for me, it was great to go see AEW. I could put my feet on the seat in front of me. Um, <laughs> we talked about uh, <laughs> Al Snow and Ohio Valley Wrestling. Yeah. Uh, there's still Al Snow is Ohio Valley's been around forever since the early 2000s. Oh my God, yeah, a long time. So I, yeah, I Danny don't, Davis started it. Yeah, Danny Davis, and and let's take a look. Even when um, the original Paul Heyman ECW died, Angelo, what filled the void? Ring of Honor, ROH, Damn. and R ROH went through different owners, as you were saying, in the slow years. They were picked up by like a Christian broadcasting company, which was a, yeah. an interesting match, right? In and, sure to hell. <laughs> and, and, but be, because they had a couple of core guys with ROH at that time, like Cody yeah. and the Young Bucks, they got AEW going. So my point is, I think over the last 25 years, uh, we talk about 2001 was kind of the, the, the death of WCW and ECW and a lot of what we grew up with. But I yeah, think there's sure. these weeds and these branches that continue. And I don't think old school wrestling is ever going to die. It just manifests into different reincarnations. I got a question for you right along that line, Mikey. Um, you mentioned Ring of Honor, ECW. They all sprung from independent organizations. Here's the question I have for you. Can we call an independent organization a territory? You know, I've been trying to figure that one out for a couple of years, Angelo. I, I, I mean, I ask people, like, if if is WWE, I mean, maybe not now because they're merged with uh, UFC for TKO. But before that, wasn't WWE an independent company? I mean, if they weren't doing business with some Japanese promotion or AEW. Well, yeah, it, and that that's a good point. They became it's funny cuz at the beginning of this I told I, I told everyone exactly how WWE became independent. They were a part of the NWA and Vince McMahon Sr. and Tootsmont and Phil Zacco broke away from Phil Mushnick in St. Louis and became the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, not under anyone else's auspices but their own. But, again, can you call, after an, a group is, is operating for a while, can you still call them independent, or are they now their own league i don't know are there are they their own federation however you wish to word that i don't even know how you would um assimilate that 
Yeah, I guess you could say like self-sustaining, and then it's like, that what do you? Cons- to put, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, do we call AEW self-sustaining? I mean, it's it's. I think it's more or less owned by a father and son who happen to be billionaires, yeah, but they didn't that earn their. Hurt. Right, but they didn't earn their money through wrestling. Like uh, wrestling is their passion piece, and I I can't say one way or the other if if AEW is in the black or in the red on its own. But the reality is. Could they have gotten that thing off the ground if they didn't have their money from Toyota and from uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars and so forth? Oh, and, probably not. No. Right. Course. So then, then you'd say like, okay, well, there's this, uh, there's this promotion down the street that gets 400 people every other week, and yeah. and they're in the black for two thousand dollars a month. We could right. call that an independent promotion. So, I think the problem, Angelo, is sometimes we try to put these these big terms on stuff. But with the world of wrestling, how wacky and unusual it is, we this world doesn't fit with with regular business terms. It's just its own. No, it never has, Mike. And thank you for for bringing that up because that's the su- that's the subject matter that is this that's the, the topic I should say that's the subject matter of so much debate. It, it's a business, but it's not. It's it's a sport, but it's not. It's entertainment, but it's not. Depending on who you ask, <laughs> but but it's all of the above and none of the above. It's 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 it exists in a bubble, and and, and they call it the wrestling bubble for a reason, because when you burst that bubble and displace all the craziness within it. They can't succeed or function in the real world, and and wrestlers can't. And you and I both know that yeah. they can't. They fail miserably and they die young because yeah. they can't succeed or function in that world. Um, yeah. been a very interesting conversation, Mike Messier. I'm going to give you, my friend, the last word on this. Well, it's been a pleasure. Um, the, lesson, the lesson learned from the territories. Well, I think history repeats itself. And I think, um, you know, Angelo, you and I and other pro wrestling enthusiasts, sometimes we drown ourselves in this information. However, I would say this, and I'm trying to teach myself this lesson, Angelo, is at some point, just go out and enjoy the matches. Like when I when I go to these NXT house shows, I put my hatred towards Vince McMahon Jr. or my disgust with their company or or who they're pushing and who they're not pushing. I put all that aside. I don't even watch the NXT weekly shows on television, Angelo. I just yeah. go to these house shows and I'm just happy that in some way, some form of another, there's a family bringing their kids to see these wrestlers and even it's another topic, but even these young women wrestlers are really like superheroes to these kids, especially these young females. And when I was a kid, with the exception of Wendy Richter and a few others, Sherry Martell and maybe Medusa, there yeah. wasn't these really competitive women wrestlers in that era. I know before then there was. My right. point is, as long as there's a ring, you know, three sets, uh, four sets of three ropes, uh, wrestling will survive. Our subject next week on Wrestling with the Future, Ric Flair, the greatest of all time or the greatest embarrassment of all time? The the uh, I, I have taken a straw poll on this, Mike Messier, yeah. and I will tell you that it wasn't even close. <laughs> it was such a lopsided vote, you don't even want to know the results. I'm I'll afraid to ask. Anyway. I'll tell you anyway, the uh, the preponderance of people, 82 percent of the people polled said Ric Flair was the greatest embarrassment of all time. The greatest embarrassment to wrestling. I I don't think so. I I mean, I I think I mean, even in the last two weeks, you could say that Vince McMahon has embarrassed himself potentially more than Ric Flair ever did. I I just think Ric Flair is Ric Flair. And, well, uh, yeah, but in terms of of you know being a wrestler, I mean he's now seventy five years old, and has no and wants another match. Does yeah, he like he retired three times already? <laughs> when when is enough enough? Because at this point, 
I just, it's just cringeworthy at this. I, like I see him, you know, and I, I think this was staged. It happened in a bar yeah. with a young guy. And they're like, there's, you know, they're bitch slapping each other. And the guy hauls off and hits Rick and knocks him on his ass. Oh, now, I it, see. it didn't take much because he was half tuned up anyway. Yeah. You know, because he's always drunk anymore. <laughs> but, you know, one of the th- one of the things I take umbrage to is go away. Please go. You had your time in the spotlight. Go away. It's over for you. You know, you got a wife, beautiful wife. You got kids. Spend time with your family. I get the same message to Dwayne Johnson. Dwayne, the fuck out, okay? <laughs> go back to Hollywood. We don't need you, don't want you anymore. It's <laughs> over. In a couple of weeks, Mikey, yep. we are doing... The WWE Hall of Fame wish list. Um, well, it's going to be an interesting show because I'm going to have you on that show. Okay. I'm also going to have an independent worker from the National Wrestling Alliance on that show. Uh, Lou Marconi is his name. He'll be with us. And I will hopefully by then, Amelia will be back. Okay. And if you're listening to this, Amelia, drink lots of tea. Take your medicine like the doctor ordered and get better. Because the last time I heard you, you sound like shit. All right. That's the good stuff I'm going to say about you. I got nothing else. Um, But that's what we got coming up, Mikey. And I, you'll be with me for that one um, in, a, in a few weeks, a couple of weeks. I think about two weeks out. Sounds and, good. Um, yeah. And we're going to talk about Ric Flair and... Maybe we'll see a couple of pictures or a video clip or two and uh, discuss the uh, the man they call the goat. I'm a Ric Flair fan, so maybe I'll take the, the defense of Nate's side of that argument just so that there is a there's, just so there's a debate with the 82. I like on a personal <laughs> level. I like yeah. Flair. I yeah. just think you know when it's your time, it's your time. Okay, go I gracefully. Yeah, I get it. You no. Know? Well, it's you know, too late for that. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> That's my problem, Mikey. All right. For Mike Messier, I am Angelo, the Mad Dog Discipio. Be good to everybody. We'll see you next week on What's the Buzz podcast every Monday and Tuesday and Wrestling with the Future every Wednesday at 7. Goodbye. We'll see you next week. God willing and the creek don't rise. Take care. Bye-bye.